We're going to work today with object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming really deals well with event-driven programming. When we first started programming, we were doing batch programming, where we would have a big file of data to process and we'd do something with it. So we would, for example, calculate payroll. We'd read in all of the information, we'd calculate taxes, but once it started, a human didn't have to interact with it. That programming style did not work as well once we got into event-driven programming, word processing, spreadsheets. Because in event-driven programming, you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what the user's going to do next. Object-oriented programming solved that and a lot of other programming issues. When you're working with object-oriented programming, you'll learn about classes, objects, polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. And the two most important things when you're first starting to program are classes and objects. And what I want you to think about when trying to understand classes and objects and how they relate is that classes actually define or describe an object. If you think about a pattern for a dress, you can have a pattern Obviously, I am not an artist. We'll say that that is our pattern for a dress. More for a pattern for a paper doll dress, but it'll work. So this is our pattern. If we were to actually create the dress from the pattern, it would be the same shape, but it could have different options. It could be a different color. The pattern describes the basic way the dress will be, but there are things that can change. Color, size, material, there's different options that you have. And the other thing you need to know is that when you have one pattern, you can make an infinite amount of dresses. This is the way object-oriented programming works. You create a class which is the pattern for an object. And any one class can create an infinite amount of objects. So the class is what we program. The object, we create an instance of it in our program so that we can use it. Another way to think of this is like if you take a image with a digital camera, you have that original, you can make copies of it, you can make them appear black and white, you can do all sorts of things, and each copy becomes an instance. Once we get into working with object-oriented programming, we don't use flow charting to describe the object-oriented programs. What we use is UML. And that's called Unified Modeling Language. And it is a language of its own. And in fact, while you don't use it to program, there are programs using UML, like Rational Rows, which can actually convert your diagrams into actual programming code. We won't get that far in this class. There will be additional software tutorials showing you how to create the, um, the class diagrams in the website. But we have a class diagram here. A class diagram is going to define our class. You can also do an object diagram. We'll get to that in a later chapter. The first thing that you would define would be the name. And then you would have properties of the dress. And then you would have things that it could do. In this case, the program would set size. It's not what the dress could do. It's what the program would do if it was making a dress. Set size, get size, set material, get material. So when working with a class, this is the name. These are the attributes 
These are the methods. Methods are what it can do. Attributes are generally private. That means that you set them with a private keyword that hides them from other programs because you, once you create a class, it can be used by any other program. But you typically want other programs to only access the methods. So there's methods where they can get the attributes and methods where they can change or set the attributes. And that's the way most classes work. So this is a class diagram. And it has a name, it has attributes, and it has methods. And we'll work with this continuously for the rest of the class. All right, let's talk about inheritance. When you create a class, you can further define that class or have a class that extends it. So you can have what's called a parent class and you can extend it. And this really should make sense to you because if you've already been categorizing things this way, you, could, you know that a, an oak is a tree, a rose is a flower. Anything that has an is a relationship already is broken down in a class structure. So let's talk about dogs. Generically, if we have a dog class, my dog will have certain attributes. It will have a breed attribute. It will have a size attribute. It will have other attributes, but we're going to keep it simple. And if we were going to do some sort of programming about our dog, we would be able to get and set breed and size. Now we can extend this further. We can take a dog and we can be more specific. Let's say that we want to further define this into a Retriever. And a retriever is going to have certain characteristics that come from being a dog and certain characteristics that are just characteristics of being a retriever. For example, we, the breed will be retriever. And we'll just say the size is large. But we can further define it. So it will inherit all of the basic attributes of the parent class, but we could also have, if it works in water, or is it a hunting dog? Because we can f further classify retrievers to be Labrador retrievers, golden retrievers, um, and they each do something a little bit different. So when you inherit something, a retriever is still a dog, and anything that would apply to a dog would absolutely apply to a retriever, but it may have other special characteristics. So we say that it is a, a retriever is a dog. And then you know that it belongs to that parent class. And we can do that in programming as well, where we have a basic class, say shape, and we can further define that class to like a circle. Because a shape would usually have a location on a grid, and it would also have a line thickness and a fill color. But then you can further define it by a square, a circle, a triangle. And so you can take those basic characteristics, add more characteristics to it, and you can extend those programming concepts. This is an example of polymorphism. You can have I want to use the example of the shape. Now let's say that we have a shape object. And one of the functions of the object is that we're going to be able to calculate the area. We can define the shape 
And if we pass nothing into it, we can do things with the shape. But if we pass parameters into it, length and width, we could calculate the area of a rectangle. If we pass in radius, we could calculate the area of a circle. Notice that these have the same name, but they have different parameters being passed into them. This is called overloading a method because you can have the same name and accept different parameters. This is an example of polymorphism where you can have the same class or object doing different things. And that's something that you get into a lot in object-oriented programming. The other key thing that you need to understand with object-oriented programming is that when you're working with classes and methods, you'll often not be the one using them. If you think about programming languages, they usually come with a whole library full of predefined classes. Things like print. And we could have two options for print. We could have print to the screen, and we could have print to the printer. which have very similar but not identical functions. Because one will print on paper, the other will change the display. And so those are different aspects in polymorphism where you can have the same command doing different things. Just like the word open can mean completely different things depending on what you're referring to. You can open a bottle, which is different than opening a door. The method of doing it is different, but you're still opening something. And that's pretty clear to people who have been working with the English language. So the other thing I want to talk about is encapsulation. When you have a library full of classes that you can use, you don't have to know all of the programming in those classes to be able to use them. You need to be able to use no parameters or what's being passed into and you need to know return values. So all you need to know to use a class that somebody else has programmed or that's in the library is what you pass to it and what it returns to you. What happens to it while it's in that class you don't need to know to be able to use a class. This is called the black box theory. You know what goes in, you know what comes out. What happens in the black box doesn't really matter. And so that allows us to use all sorts of different classes. Now with visual logic, an example of this is we have the format currency. And we'll pass in a value like salary, which would refer to a variable, and we'll get a return value where it is formatted with dollar signs, commas, and decimal points. We don't need to know how it does it, we just need to know what we're going to pass in and what we're going to get back. That's called encapsulation. So those are your basic concepts for object-oriented programming. For assignments this week, we're going to work on creating some class diagrams. And I'll have additional videos using the software to do that. Okay, that's chapter 10.